The last few weeks we've had stories of generosity, then we had last week with Steph doing a magnificent job just talking about generosity from the perspective of turning away from greed and living simply and having margin in our life. And so I'm going to just put our first slide up for um, reminding you where we've been travelling and if you haven't been there, then at least it'll be like, oh, that's what she's talking about. <laughs> so next one, thanks. So, next one, please. So do you remember in Second Corinthians, Corinthians 8, we saw how the Jerusalem church sprung out in all different directions. Church planting was happening and Paul was speaking to a specific need saying, those guys in Jerusalem are in need. And he told the Antioch church, he told all the churches around, the Macedonians sprang to action. And we saw in 2 Corinthians 8 that the Corinthian church were a little bit slower to spring to action. And I wanted just to finish our series with giving you some of the things that we've not been able to have on the slides that the finance team had a very tight timeline. And so I just wanted to say we're also acknowledging this ripple effect that happens through your lives. Let's have a look at what 2024 looked like for YVV. This is a similar thing. That if we could look at the ripple effect of what's happening, whether you put in something into the buckets or whether you are giving online or whether you are just living a general generos generosity lifestyle, this is what you have been able to spring into action with the ripple effect. It's been so exciting to see all these things in different locations through your lives and through our lives together. Pretty amazing, right? And so we've even got um, next year, we're looking again at doing the Pong in April. And so we'll have some more conversation with that coming with where we're again looking at how can we raise awareness and funds towards those that are trying again to live in um, a place where the, we can help prevent modern day slavery and trafficking. So that will be happening with another amazing team that's starting that conversation now. We also so remember that the prison ministry ends here today with Prison Fellowship. There he is. He's been on the road all year talking to people just about how to serve people in prisons. And you guys helped by baking at Easter and sending those biscuits. I think there were like 26 lots of biscuits that went out to prisoners at Easter because of your generosity and because of Ian's amazing ministry with Brad. You're in it too, right, Brad? Yeah, prison ministry. Rod. <laughs> Rod, almost there. Um, we've had work parties going to New South Wales. All, all sorts of things have been happening locally as well as through your generosity. A boarding house that's just been a wonderful story that's been happening this week with support happening there for some of the residents there and for some people that we dearly love. And I also heard from Christine sitting up there in the red check this week. Here's how the ripple effect works, okay? So you know how you guys all helped by giving some really amazing stuff during winter to Mustard Tree Op Shop? Remember we did that? Like we had it all in the back, took it to them. And Denise and Christine helped to coordinate that. So Christine was telling some friends about that who live at Tudor Village, who is also on our radar. Some people that we know go to Tudor Village and regularly, regularly gather there, right? Once a month or so. They wait every week. So this group that meets every week took this, this news from Christine. Ah, oh, I reckon we could do that. We could also give to the mustard tree op shop. So this group at Tudor Village then said, oh, there's 30 of us. That would be 30 things. Let's do that. Of course, they gave more than one thing. And so they took bags to the mustard tree op shop. The village is then watching this go on with this little group of 30. And they're like, oh, come and talk to us about that. How can we get involved? Now the whole village is wanting to take bags to the mustard tree op shop. There's more. After that, <laughs> after that, there's a men's shed that is now heard through these guys. Ripple effect. Oh, the mustard tree op shop needs some more food for their food bank. So this ripple effect happens as you continue to live generously and tell the good news. So even what you're hearing today, as you go out and say, oh, we're involved in whatever you're involved in, has a ripple effect. It's like putting that pebble into the water and the kingdom generosity expands. How cool is that? 
And so again, we've just got people, we can't fit all of this on the screen and we know that we are missing people out, but we've got people that have supported families that have had newborns from this church. We've had people deliver hampers and home-cooked meals to people during winter that have been unwell. We've had all sorts of things happening through you and your generosity and it looks like that and more. So well done. Just give yourselves another clap. <clears throat> So the Bible tells us freely you receive, freely give. And I just really want to honour you all to, in the way that you're doing that. And Proverbs tells us that a generous person, a generous person will prosper and whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. So that's my prayer as we wrap this all up with a bow on it, that you will be refreshed as you step into God's work and as you find out the joy of putting your your things, your generous time, your investment, your finances, your resources into kingdom disposal. Local churches are definitely God's plan <laughs> for extending his kingdom and this hopefully gives you a visual. This is who we are and this is who we'll continue to grow to be. Um, I did want to say one practical thing. If you are a regular giver here and you haven't seen this sheet and you need some help to find out how to give, we just wanted to also leave that resource on the table. As you leave, you can just choose the way that is best for you to regularly give. Let me pray. Lord, we thank you. I just thank you again for this joyful time that we're in as we worship you as we give to you, but also as we know that you're meeting us. And so as we open your word now, we ask, Lord, that you would be the living word, that we'd feed on you in our hearts. Amen. Turn to Luke 12 as we finish up, and we are going to look at a parable, and it's one of Jesus' famous teachings. It's a long teaching, and again, as Miles said, we could do 40 slides, but we won't be doing that today. This is just going to be looking at one of the parables. And Jesus' words and instructions, he's talking to his disciples, and he's saying that there's this one famous line that we all know, sell your possessions and give to the poor. But around that, he book bookends it with two really big stories and he's talking about not being anxious and he's talking about it's the father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom in the midst of that he sells, says sell all your possessions and give to the poor so we're going to be looking not at the rich fool parable we're going to be looking at the second part the faithful servant because it's a more positive story to be honest <laughs> and it's about a servant and he's um, doing well and I feel like the Lord's smile is upon us as we read this. So this is the second parable in Luke 12. We're reading the teaching of Jesus as he spoke this. Be dressed ready for service and keep your lamps burning. Like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and he knocks, they can immediately open the door for him and it will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. And then there's a twist because the master has come and knocked on the door and he, Jesus says the master will dress himself to serve and will have them recline at the table and he will come and wait on them. Don't you love the upside down kingdom? The master that's returning, that owns all of this stuff, he then puts on servant clothes and serves. Does that sound like someone we know? Jesus is reminding us this kingdom is upside down to what we're expecting. And then good old Peter asks a question. And on the next slide, you're going to see how Jesus answers this question. He said, the Lord said, who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them the food, their food allowance at the proper time? It will be good for that servant when the master finds doing so. So when he returns, truly I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. The whole household, he'll be in charge of all of it even more resources. He'll be blessed with even more. Our theme for this year came from our treasurer. It was all about more. This is the, the 
the thing we're founded on, that God promises more to those who give in the way that the master looks for. Sadly, in verse 45, we see that it doesn't go so well for all the servants because the servant says to himself, my master is taking a long time coming. And so then he begins to beat the other servants, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk. Not so good. Let's keep going. Verse 46. The ending continues. The master of that servant then will come on a day and when he does not expect him and an hour when he is not aware of and he will cut him into pieces and assign him a place with unbelievers. Key verse that we want to get to, verse 48. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from everyone who is entrusted with much, much more will be asked. So today we are finishing by looking at what does it look like to be entrusted with much so that we then can be living with Jesus, taking care of what he's given us. And we call that stewardship. Stewardship is a word that means active and responsible management. You've heard from some of our finance team today, they've been stewards of what is being given to this church. But stewardship is an overarching thing that Jesus talks about in this parable, where there's active and responsible management for all of God's creation, for his purposes, for his good purposes. So we're going to look at two things that stewardship means for us as we finish today with our series. First one is that God owns everything. He owns it all. Who agrees with that? Yeah, we're here to worship him. He's the one that owns it all. And we know that from the very first words in the Bible in Genesis, where we see the story of God creating heavens and earth, which is everything. And then along comes a garden that is built just for humans to come, Adam and Eve, and even the gift of air as they breathe and they are brought to life. They are then given these words. This is the stewardship that God is saying over all that he owns. He says to Adam and Eve in the garden, work it and take care of it. Caretaking. Work the garden and take care of it. God's creation. And so I don't know whether you have kind of tuned into how much more this generosity is opening up for us it's so much more than our cash and our resources. God's inviting us to steward the whole thing that he has created for us. Anyone here house sat, been a house sitter, where you've looked after someone else's house? A few of you? A few of you have? Yeah, it's such a privilege. I got invited to house sit for a beautifully big house. It had a pool. Ooh, it had a beautiful garden. It had this amazing, like almost as big as that oval um, outlook. And I had to caretake it. It was exhausting. <laughs> I had to find all my friends. Who enjoys riding a mower? I don't enjoy doing that on my Saturdays. Who likes looking after pools? I had to get a lot of help to caretake. I wasn't so good at doing it on my own. <laughs> but God is saying that he's going to give us all something to caretake. And it's like we're house-sitting, expecting that we have to keep things well for the master might return any time. And I knew the people that I was caretaking that big, big house for, at any time they might turn up so it had to be ready for their return. Similar, right? Similar to what Jesus is saying here. But this time, we're talking about God, our generous God, who entrusts all of his resources to us to do good. That's the second thing. He owns it all. Then he says, here, I entrust it to you. Do good with what I give you. And so we are going to land today with that just that sense of blessing that you have so much given to you. And God's saying, do good with it. Do good with it. And I love that I just can't stop looking at the back and seeing all those bags that are there that are going to be a ripple effect. Because you are on it, YVV. Do good. And you're on it. And we're, we're just saying, Lord, we agree with you. We want to live like that. And so we've heard over the last few weeks that money that we get, resources that we have to share, 
we also want to make margin for others. So it's for us, but also for others. And so we are saying today, you also have resources to enjoy. Today, I want to put up the next slide as our finish point to say, if we could go back to the Timothy one, it would look like a little, that's it. Today, I want to say over us, as Timothy said over the people that he was writing to, that God has richly provide, he richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. And we get to share that as part of being caretakers and stewarding what he's given us. God richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. So here's today's challenge for this week. Today's invitation. Our conversation continues. What do you enjoy that God's given you? Can you share it with someone this week? I want you to deliberately say, Lord, I really enjoy oh, that and I'm going to share that with someone this week. What is something good in your life that you want to share with others? Perfect example is Jess and Miles saying, we want to have Sunday sandwiches. Come to our place. And 40 of you going, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to go there and enjoy that. What's on your heart that you want to share? It might be big or small that you could do good to someone else as you share that because you enjoy it already. And so the Father's with you in that already. So now we'll do the next slide. Thanks with stewardship written on it. Up, oh, back, back, back. <laughs> there we go. God owns it all. We're entrusted by God with his resources to do good. So three things, live, give, and build. So this is just summarizing all that we've looked at. And I want to tell you a story about someone that really enjoyed something. And it's almost another parable. And it's a story about Brad Kirkwood. Some of you know him as Kirk. Who knows Brad? Some of you? Yeah, so from, great, a few of you know this, and so some of you will know this story. This is Brad living, stewarding. He's a man of the land. He's a farmer. He loves being out in the garden. He loves farming. Brad rocks up to church a number of years ago. He says, Di, I've got a great story for you. And he, I switched on my phone because I love great stories and I want to carry them with me, his testimonies. So I switched on the phone, which is why I've got this almost word for word from Brad. Okay, it's as if Brad's here. Wish he was. <laughs> so Brad says, I've got all these fruit trees in my backyard and I'm noticing that they're flowering, but there's no fruit. So Brad's conversation all that week has been with God and with himself and others. Ah, oh, I've got trees that are flowering. And his question is, hmm, where are the bees? There's no bees pollinating these trees. So his next question to God, his prayer, what's on his heart as he's living and enjoying this working the land is, wonder where bees are in suburbia. Where do they live? right? Because he's a farming guy and he's used to knowing, oh, I know where they live in the country. What about amongst houses? So he, all day, he's just working the land, he's ploughing, he's out there doing his garden. And then he thinks, oh, I wonder how I'm going to get bees here. Goes in, has dinner with his family. In the evening, before it's dark, he sees this cloud of black and bees have landed on a tree in his backyard. Can you imagine God moving that fast? <laughs> there. So he's out the back going, oh my gosh, God, you've, can you make them stay in my yard? <laughs> That's his first conversation point. Make them stay on that tree. And then they clung to this tree on his yard and he was really super happy but also aware this could change any moment, right? So Brad then, he gets a drum and he puts it out under the tree as you always have. Who's got a drum in your backyard? Brad does. And he brings the lid over and then he gets bitten by one of them. So he realises, okay, these bees are going to bite. I need to let them settle. And then he goes and gets some smoke and he does the whole thing of cutting that branch into the drum, putting a lid on it, and guess what he said? I've got a hive. <laughs> Within 24 hours, Farmer Brad 
has a hive in his backyard for the solution for him. He's going to enjoy it, live, enjoy all that God gives him. And can you imagine how much of the fruit from those trees he shared with those? And then can you imagine how his neighbours benefited from being a hive in that backyard? This is kind of kingdom generosity at the best. I even have read that this, this week I read that there was a church that has put hives on, they have a, a location in suburbia, and they put hives on their church roof so that the neighbours are no longer complaining about cars in the streets because they've now got bees, honey, all sorts of goodness happening because they've now got bees on the roof in hives. It's amazing how kingdom generosity ripple effect, Right? So that's a way to enjoy what's on your heart that you want to ask God and have a conversation with God about. So the second part of that is living and giving. And of course, we've been talking a lot about that in the last few weeks, about having our resources for those that are in need, those that are poorer, those that are in ministry, and also just for the sake of the gospel that we are putting our resources and giving to what God has put on our hearts. And the third one is a little bit of an indicator of what our finance team are beginning to stretch towards. So we had Mr. Strategy, Miles, coming to say, this is how I'm thinking. He's thinking about his family and his kids and the future of this church and how's that going to look. So he's bringing all that good strategy in the way that he's thinking about building, building the kingdom through what we do here. And we're starting to believe, oh my gosh, I think we're starting to see a bit of a change in the trajectory of giving. What else is on our hearts for ministry in this area? What else is it going to look like at this time next year as all of our kingdom generosity floods through stewarding what he's given us? We're excited. We're very excited. And the finance team look forward to being able to continue to sit with your thoughts and with our thoughts, but mostly with God's thoughts about what he has for our future. So what are you building? What are you entrusted by God with his resources that are going to be a channel and that you'll be able to respond so that every dollar goes to do good and into the right place? So as we finish today, <clears throat> we're just going to continue to learn from the Corinthian church and all they were instructed. Thank you for the, the next slide. Well done. <laughs> and we are reminded that giving givers through the Corinthian church were being reminded that on the first day of every week, be regular. Be regular with your giving. Set aside a sum. Interestingly, fun fact Sunday is not always the first day of the week for everyone. People that get paid, we are now, we have got stats saying that many people are now saying Friday is their first day where they set aside because they get paid on Thursday and the first thing they want to do is Friday, they want to regularly give. And they're not normally yet at church, so it goes online. I just thought that's really a change in giving. People are listening to how do I give and what's regular giving look like setting aside a sum of money for kingdom work. It's proportional, so Corinthians are told each one of you must set aside a sum of money keeping within your income. So if you have a lot to share, make it proportional. If you have little to share, make it proportional to how much you have. Basic life necessities are important. Enjoy those first and also be aware that we would never want anyone to go into debt just simply to be looking generous. We want people to be receiving and giving like a channel going to the right place. That thing, sacrificial, oh, it's going to hurt a little bit. If it's sacrificial, it will mean there will be some cost to it. And so we say again in Corinthians, it says, they gave as much as they were able, even beyond their ability. Isn't that encouraging to hear that that's something that God honours as well? And then we create margin in order to give, to give, but we don't give with fear of being without. 
we give sacrificially, but we also recognise that there is a flow that comes as we receive, we also give. I can remember a sacrificial gift where I was personally wrestling because I didn't have that margin, but I knew God was tapping my heart and saying, would you give to that need there? And I remember sitting at my kitchen table, pressing send for this amount, and I had wrestled with it for all day. And within 24 hours, I had a knock at the door from someone else that had been listening to God. And they had in an envelope on my front step the exact amount that I'd sent to another need. Amazing. This came at a time when I was really very feeling very vulnerable because I had an old car. There are lots of things that didn't work for me in that I wasn't feeling comfortable. And so to even do that first press give to someone else was sacrificial. But at the same time, what was happening for me that at that moment was my dad was very sick on his last few months of being with us and lived eight hours away. So if I ever wanted at that period to go and visit him, when we got the call, oh, I think he's about to go, can you make it? For me to get into that car, I had to hire a car to actually do that trip because it wasn't safe for me to go on my own in my own car. And so all this was swirling around, can I even buy a flight? I don't have any of that stretch right now. I'm not whining, I'm just saying that's how it was. And so I had that wrestle going on that to push that button to give to someone else meant I wouldn't be able to fly to see my dad. And it also meant that I was just having to trust him more. So to have that very quick response from other believers that were hearing from God and delivered something risky by turning up on my doorstep and saying, we think God wants to give you this, enabled me to get on a flight enabled me to be able to see my dad and it was very special and so all those ripple effects can you see how it works one decision has ripples for everyone just so grateful being a part of a church that is so responsive and sacrificial fourth very quickly voluntary um again we don't want to be giving anything with your hand behind your back and twisting your arm. We're just simply saying, as the Corinthians were, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly and not with compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. <laughs> he loves a cheerful giver, not grumpy money. He loves cheerfulness. And so the more that we're able to see joy in the way that we give, the more that we're experiencing the kingdom. And the final thing is just be motivated by Jesus, who is the one that gave it all, the one that sacrificed all. And if you have any questions about what should I be giving, how much, where, what, talk to him. He will tell you, and if you need help with discerning how much to give wherever it is or to respond to him, just remember you have the Holy Spirit with you speaking, and he will lead you into joyful giving. So we're going to tie up today with just a declaration together. And we're going to do it in a way that some of you will feel comfortable standing and others might feel more comfortable sitting. That's okay. And we're thinking of this ripple effect as we say these words in this prayer to finish. We're thinking that you are already in a ripple effect. You're already, because you've said yes to Jesus, there's a ripple going out of your life. Whether you've tuned into the generosity of God or whether you haven't yet, you've said yes to him, so kingdom life is flowing through you. And so we're just going to simply say today, we want that. We want more of that, Lord. We want to be a church that looks like that, that is visible. Visible kingdom life. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read three prayers, and they're going to be having postures of hands, our hands mirroring what we're praying this is coming from a lady, Danielle Strickland, who does this every day. And she goes into prisons, she goes into brothels to help serve and meet people's needs. 
It's a good prayer to have. And so I've got it on the screen. Um, so we're going to have hands up for surrender. Then I'm going to read a surrender prayer for us all. And then you can say amen at the end if you agree with that and you want to join in on that. And then I'm going to pray a generosity prayer with our hands out. And then we're going to think about what the finance team have encouraged us with, that we're on a mission. And so we're going to put our hands forward and pray a prayer for other focused that's not about us. We're, what are we sharing our resources with? Yep, for that. Would you like to stand if you can? If you would need to be seated, that's okay too. And let's start with our hands up. You can put it up as high as you like. Hands up to surrender. Here's our prayer as we pray together. Jesus, I choose to hold up my hands as a symbol of surrender. My life is not about me. I surrender to your lordship. I surrender my preferences, my prejudices, and my position to you. I surrender my fears, my finances, my friends and family to you. And all the people said, Amen. Now, hands out, as if we're extending it out to others, we're going to pray about generosity. Jesus, I choose to hold out my hands as a symbol of generosity. What I have is not mine. I am only a steward of all that you have given me. I want to mirror the way that you opened your hand to us and lavished your love and life upon us. I want to live open-handed living in a closed-fisted culture. And all the people said, Amen. And then finally, other focused mission, hands forward, like you're going to give a hug, like you're going to reach out to someone else. I choose, Lord, to hold my hands forward as a symbol of mission. I choose, Lord, that I want to live for something greater than me. And I want to embrace your kingdom mission. And I want to embrace and welcome your mission to the lost, to the last to the least and to the lonely, to the poor and to the powerless and to the privileged and to the persecuted. We will do that in your name, Jesus. And all the people said, Amen. Oh, big prayers, right? <laughs> So we know the power of prayers. You've just joined in that prayer. Open your eyes and your heart as you move through this week. You're going to see a shift. You're going to see something come towards you that maybe you haven't before. And as we finish today, I just want to again thank you for being a part of this journey of generosity and thank you for moving into December with joyful hearts as we meet needs, as we meet our own um, <laughs> our own vulnerability of what we need and receive, and then we also meet the needs of those around us. So let me just pray a blessing on you. Father, thank you again for this time. Thank you for the way that you are leading this church. Thank you that this is your people. <laughs> this is a group of people that love you. And so as they leave, would you just send them out with joy, with celebration that you lead them on into an amazing week. Amen.